Let's start off by generating some random numbers and then plotting them. Now let's say there's a point that we want to highlight. One way to do it is to identify which point it is and plot it with some different formatting. This is okay, but first I had to figure out the index of the point I wanted to change. I'll leave it as an exercise to figure out how I did that. We might also want to say something about that point. The annotate function lets you add notes to your figures. The first argument is the text that will appear. The xy argument is where the interesting data point is. This avoids having to search in our data for the index of that interesting data point. This argument specifies that our coordinates are data coordinates, which is actually the default. The alternative is to specify the position relative to the figure. For example, 75% of the way up the figure and halfway across. Font size is obvious, I hope. The values are in points, which is the same as in most text editors. A point is 1 72nd of an inch. Generally, you can find a good value by experimentation. This argument gives the position where the text goes. We can also choose to specify this relative to the figure, but it uses data coordinates by default. Finally, we can change the style of the arrow that goes from the text to the point we are annotating. Here's the result. We can, of course, change the font, the text color, and a bunch of other properties, as always. We talked about using name colors to distinguish between different data sets in the same axes in the first video. We can also apply a color map to the data. This is useful if you want to indicate some other property of the points. Say each point was taken at a different temperature. We could use a hotter color for measurements taken at higher temperatures and a cooler one for lower temperature measurements. Here, just to show how it works, we calculate the sum of each point's x and y coordinates as the extra data. This will return a NumPy array, which we then pass as the C argument. Note we don't use the color argument for this. You can only input color names there. Here's the result. The darker colors are more negative and the lighter ones are more positive. This color gradient has a name, Viridis. There are tons of other color maps with different properties. For example, the sequential color maps can be useful for indicating a property like height or intensity that varies across the data. A diverging map can be useful if the property has poles or opposites. For example, using blue for cold and red for hot and smoothly interpolating between them. There are lots of others. Some of these range over many colors, so they can be particularly useful if you want to emphasize the fine differences in the values that the color gradient is mapping. We can specify which color map to use with the CMAP argument. The Vmin and Vmax arguments define the lower and upper limits of the color map. The data in C is scaled to be in a range Vmin to Vmax. This is a result which looks quite nice, however we can't assume that the person looking at the figure knows what color map we picked. We have to provide some kind of scale. Color bars have caused me a lot of grief in my life of making plots, however making a basic one is fairly straightforward. First we need to capture the output of the scatter function. This returns a matplotlib object called a path collection, which is just matplotlib's way of saving all the little circles that make up the plot. We then call the color bar function with pc as an argument. pc keeps track of the colors and their values, and the color bar function gets them, figures out how to draw a scale, adds it to the figure, and returns a color bar object. We can then customize the color bar by calling methods of that object. In this case, all we do is add a label. Now we have a color bar. All plot types have their own customization options, and we don't have time to go over every single one. For example, here we have the pie chart, and we're modifying the explode parameter. This is a list of offsets. Each number is the fraction of the radius by which to offset each slice. Here, only the first slice is affected. The other options add a shadow, and rotate the pie chart by 90 degrees. Here's the output. One of the best things you can do to learn matplotlib is to go to the documentation and have a look at the examples gallery. There are tons of interesting figures there, and you can usually find a good template for any kind of figure you want to make. This is an example of a polar plot, which is a modified bar chart. These are rarely used, except in a matplotlib logo. Basically, instead of plotting on the horizontal axis, we wrap the axis up into a circle. They look kind of cool and introduce a concept which we will use a number of times, so let's see how to make one. This is the code that generates a previous figure. It's a little complicated, so let's go through it slowly. The key part that wraps up the axis is here. We specify the polar projection argument to the subplots function. The projection function will be very useful when we come to making 3D plots in the next video, and also when we come to plotting spatial data. Here we just make some random data. This is just a standard way we make a bar chart. The polar projection we set up earlier is applied when the figure is rendered, and we get the circle plot we saw earlier. This gives us a flavour of why colour maps are sometimes annoying to deal with. The bar function doesn't let us specify a colour map, like scatter does. To get nicely coloured bars, we have to do a little more work. First we create a colour map object using matplotlib cm module. Jet is just the name of a colour map. We then create a normaliser object using the colours module. This is an object which normalizes data in the interval 0 to 1. We first call the normalizer on the y data, then we call the cmap, which takes the normalized numbers and returns a color. This is the output. Adding a color bar here is surprisingly tricky, but not impossible. This is often the case. If you do something outside the defaults, further manipulations of the figure can get more tricky, but they're almost never impossible. If you find yourself constantly changing the defaults, you can, of course, change them permanently. There are a couple of ways to do this. One simple way is to change the RC params dictionary, where matplotlib stores all the default settings. These lines change the default behavior of the plot function. 
Lines will now be width 2 and dashed unless we specify otherwise. It's actually quite tricky to customize the defaults for scatter, but apart from that, almost everything can be changed through the RC params. This changes the default colors. Instead of going blue to orange to green as usual, we can make the colors whatever we want. Here we have a cycle of three that goes red, green, blue. This is the output. Another way to change the default is to use style sheets. There are a number of predefined ones. Here I'm using one called ggplot. This is what it looks like. You can define your own style sheet if you wish, though to be honest I've never needed to do this. I like the matplotlib default. Finally, matplotlib uses configuration files to customize all kinds of properties. The file is called matplotlibrc, which is read at startup to configure matplotlib. The command shown here will print the location of the matplotlibrc file that you're currently using. If you want to create your own, you can put a new one in your current working directory. This could be good if you have a project which has unusual defaults and you don't want to have to keep setting them. You can also edit the system matplotlibrc file, which is usually in one of these directories depending on your operating system. Now you know enough for 90% of the plotting you'll ever need to do. In the next two videos we'll cover some more advanced visualizations that can be quite useful and impressive.